coming up on Garden Talk. So like when you look at soils, or like ProMix HP, the ProMix High Porosity with mycorrhizae, it has almost no mycorrhizae in it because they put it in at like a per yard rate, and it's really small to begin with. But they have mycorrhizae on the label. Microbes are able to act like a buffer, and they're able to deliver nutrition at much wider ranges of pH, especially when you have a good consortia or breakdown of uh, the different microbes that are in there. A lot of people don't realize with amino acids, if they're not in their L form, they are not plant available at all. So like it has to be L-amino acids or your plant's not going to be able to utilize them at all. They actually make compounds that help the plant be able to have a more like fibrous and dense root system. The bacillus and the different types of trichoderma fungi that can be in there are going to be the ones that are doing the majority of the work for everything while mycorrhizae gets all the fame. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Groat. And you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 27. In this episode, I talk with Guru from The Dude Grow Show. He has been gardening for 11 years and grows a variety of plants, such as tomatoes, cucumbers, blueberries, blackberries, medicinal varieties, beets, and more. In this episode, we talk all about microbes. He talks about several different types of microbes and how they benefit plant growth. Thanks to all of you that support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we go any further, I want to acknowledge that this podcast is part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost for information about gardening to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. A big supporter of this podcast is Spider Farmer. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their LED grow lights. Spider Farmer now has a bar-style series of LED grow lights. They have the SE3000, a 4-bar fixture for a 3-foot by 3-foot grow space. The SE5000, a 6-bar fixture for a 4-foot by 4-foot grow space. And the SE7000, a 6-bar fixture for a 5-foot by 5-foot grow space. I will leave a link to Spider Farmer down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowAt5 during checkout for a discount on their products. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. They sent me over their grow tent, which has a canvas density of 2000D, making them the thickest grow tent on the market today. It has an aluminum plate that mounts your controller to the grow tent with a lightproof pass-through for cable routing. The frame has 50% thicker steel poles, and carries two times more weight than the standard grow tents. Coupon code MrGrowIt will get you a discount on their products, and I'll leave a link to their website down in the description section below. Dutch Pro is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code MrGrowIt10DP will get you a discount on their products. They are a plant fertilizer company that has been around for over 30 years. They originated in Amsterdam, and their nutrients are available in several countries across the world. They have everything needed for proper plant nutrition, from base nutrients to additives and pH regulators. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below. And don't forget to use coupon code MrGrowIt10DP for a discount on their products. All right, now let's get into the episode. All right, we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. I am here joined with the grow guru from the Dude Grow Show. How are you doing today? What's going on, man? How you doing? Happy to be here. Super excited to have you on, man. I mean, you're, I've been watching the Duke Grow Show for a very long time, and you came on. I know you came on like three, four hundred episodes deep or whatever, and uh, you just add so much value to the show, and it, it's, your knowledge is extensive in so many different areas. And um, yeah, it, it's definitely really fun watching you, and it's an honor to kind of have you on here and, and pick your brain even deeper. So. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. Pick away. But before we get into microbes, which is the topic today, we'll get all into microbes. So many different microbes, so much to talk about. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening. Uh, so, I mean, it started when I was really young. Uh, my grandmother got me into gardening, and one of my grandfathers was also a master gardener growing up. So, I mean, it just plants were always around. My mom has a beautiful garden, um, and it was just always something that interests me a lot. Um, plants are really cool and I specifically like to take a a much more science approached or science backed approach to medicinal herb gardening for sure. Nice. And so you decided to, you joined the dude grow show. How did that all come about? If you don't mind me asking, how did you kind of join the team there? And that was in 2017, right? Uh, 2016, um, is when I first moved out to Colorado, I had met up with Scott a couple years earlier. 
um, they had been talking about Black Dog LED and saying that there's no good LEDs out there. They're all blurples and stuff. And at the time, I was in uh, in school and designing and building my own LED lights and selling them to some people. Uh, ended up not going along that path. Uh, but I got in touch with Scott and was like, hey, you guys are giving people really bad advice about this. LEDs are the future. Uh, HPS is like a thing of the past. This is something you need to talk about. You need to let people know that there's uh, good information on this out there, and there are good LEDs out there that far surpass what LED, or what HPS could do. So Scott flew me out to uh, one of the cups, came, hung out with them for a while, decided I was going to move out to Colorado. Uh, I was still in school at the time, and moved out and then Scott had a job for me right away and started getting rolling with the dude grow show. That's awesome. I think you, you guys really complement each other. You know, you all have different personalities, you know, you dude, Scotty, and you guys just flow so well together. It's pretty cool. I actually hear that a lot with on my podcast from the stash with me, Rob from hitters lifestyle TV and pigeons 420. I feel like it's similar. You guys just flow so well together. It's awesome. And it's, I actually it, do it. I was going to say, we're we're all, uh, and you guys too, we're all really good foils for each other. Um, everyone has different approaches to things, um, and it's cool to get those different ideas uh, for so, as a listener to be able to listen to that and be able to make your own decision off of stuff and hear just a variety of ideas. Well said. I do have a few numbers here. You guys have on the Dude Gross channel over 67,000 subscribers, 1,892 videos, <laughs> over 9.3 million views combined. So you guys have been very successful and uh, definitely thank you for your efforts there. And I'm excited to see what you guys got in the future. Thank you. Yeah, it was really cool to be able to, like I grew up in Virginia where, I mean, everything related to medicinal gardening was super hush-hush. Um, and getting out here and being able to be on a YouTube show and share some knowledge with people and get everyone uh, just growing better has been really cool. Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> right? And hel helping people, which is uh, like one of my favorite things to do, and educating them and helping them at the same time. And then like my favorite thing is hearing a new grower get back in touch with us, say they found the podcast or the YouTube show, and they got their first harvest, and it was awesome and how happy they are. That fucking that gets me super rewarding Absolutely. oh yeah before we get deep into specific microbes uh, tell us what are microbial inoculants and how are they beneficial in the garden so there's a couple different ways that those microbial inoculants are going to be beneficial in the garden first and foremost they act as root growth promoting rhizobacteria where they actually make compounds that help the plant be able to have a more like fibrous and dense root system um which i mean we've all heard it before more roots more fruits um and just an overall healthier plant that can absorb more nutrition because plants can only absorb nutrition from the tips of the root. Um, and these plant growth, uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria are able to get more tips around by growing out more tertiary and secondary roots. Uh, but at the same time, those bacteria have evolved over millions of years uh, in a symbiotic relationship with the plant, where not only do they do that, the plant puts out carbohydrates uh, as exudates to feed them and kind of control the microbial population that's there so that it can uh, like exponentially increase the surface area of its root zone. Um, and just those microbes are able to break down nutrient, um, get it into an ionic form and hold on to it until the plant signals that it needs it. And then they can get it to the plant. Um, and none of that is it. Uh, that, that's all as far as like plant nutrition and plant growth. Um, they also put up like a no vacancy sign to pathogens. They would normally get into your, your garden and there'd be room for them to grow and expand. And that's when you end up with something like Pythium or Phytophthora, um, those really bad root diseases. But when you have good beneficial microbes in there, uh, they are making compounds that uh, make it not a, a hospitable environment for those uh, bad actors. Um, and also just puts up the no vacancy sign telling them like, hey, there's no room for you here, man. Go somewhere else. That's pretty cool. That makes sense. Now, some folks, um, I, I think it's pretty well known, you know, if you're a beginner, you might not know this, but a lot of folks that are above the beginner stage, intermediate stage, know that there are synthetic nutrients that are plant available. They're already in a form that the plant can uptake. Then there are organic nutrients, which need to be broken down by microbes first. And that's where microbes are especially important, you know, having these different microbial inoculants, adding them into the medium to help with that breakdown process is key on the organic side of things. Now, there's some folks out there that are going to say, well, I'm using synthetic bottled nutrients. 
or mineral-based, salt-based, whatever you want to call it, um, microbes aren't going to be beneficial for me at all. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Is that true or not? Or, or what? Oh, first and foremost, definitely not true. I hear this all the time, and it's one of the big myths in gardening, uh, especially in that synth- synthetic style of gardening. Uh, those nutrients there's a big problem with them just washing away or there being uh, like pH lockout in the soil. Um, Microbes are able to act like a buffer and they're able to deliver nutrition at much wider ranges of pH, especially when you have a good consortia or breakdown of uh, the different microbes that are in there. Um, So yeah, I mean, you microbes are key and in synthetic. um, It is important to note that uh, like endogenous microorganisms, ones that are just in your yard, in the backyard or in your compost, when you brew a compost tea, most of those don't persist uh, that great in like an agricultural or horticultural system. Um, Just the higher salinity environments, it's much more environmental stress on those microbial populations. Uh, But one of the cool things about microbes is you can go through successive uh, generations of breeding them really quickly and uh, kind of select for the environment that you want to be in. And not all microbes are created equal. You can kind of think of them like technology products um, where someone's Bacillus subtilis. Uh, it might say the exact same thing on the label that it's Bacillus subtilis, but there can be a wide variety of like different strains of them um, and how uh, the different environments that they're able to operate in are. So, I mean, you can have one thing on one label, one on another, but like one might work way better because it's been designed to operate in like that higher salinity environment, containerized gardening, uh, like the high turnover crops where like you really want to get the best growth you possibly can uh, as early on and through the entire life cycle of the plant. So it's definitely still beneficial even if you're using synthetic oh, nutrients in an ionized form. It's still beneficial to have microbes to use microbial inoculants. Oh, most definitely, because yeah. another cool thing they're able to do, uh, it's called adsorbing. Uh, the microbes do kind of the same thing soil particles do. Uh, when ionic uh, nutrients flow through it, uh, those nutrients adsorb onto soil particles and then are kind of stuck there until a root comes along with a higher affinity to that ion that's stuck to the soil particle. Um, microbes kind of act like in that same way where they can adsorb this nutrition and then be able to hold on to it in a plant available form and deliver it to the plant. Um, so you don't, you can, when you're using good microbes, you're able to cut back on your nutrients too, just because you're more efficiently and effectively getting that into the plant. That's so cool. That's really interesting. Let's so yeah, about- I mean, a big, big myth that we hear all the time and, uh, it's, it's taken a, a lot of education for people to be like, no, 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 like you still need to use it. And that's just talking about it in terms of plant nutrition. Um, as a bioprotectant in the soil and prevent, especially if you're in hydroponics, preventing Pythium and Phypothera. I don't know if you've ever had those in a garden. No. Um, if you're in a hydroponic system and it's connected together, like on a central reservoir that can wipe out an entire garden in a day and a half, um, where it turns all your roots, your pearly white roots to just mush. Um, and a good way around not ever having to deal with that is using good microbes in there that act as a bioprotectant um, in the soil or in whatever media you're using. So the idea is it's kind of like pest management, um, but with the, these pathogens, where get the good microbes in there inhabiting the root zone so that when Pythium or Phypothera shows up, uh, it never has a chance to even take hold. The good microbes are just there and outcompete it um, for the same resources in the same space. What about hydrogen peroxide? I heard that as a remedy for it. That is one of the remedies uh, kind of going with the old uh, style of thinking on things where like I need to keep everything as sterile as I possibly can, like a operating room at a hospital. Um, And I mean, the same thing kind of happens in operating rooms and hospitals. uh, They have pan resistant uh, bacteria um, that just like no antibiotics work on. Uh, you get into that where like, if you're just always sterilizing things, nature's not sterile and it's really hard, really, really hard to keep things sterile, especially a plant. And you're losing all of the good, uh, like bioprotective features of good, uh, microbial consortia living in the root zone. Cause hyd- hydrogen peroxide is going to kill whatever microorganisms you have. Good in and there. bad, right? Good, and, good and bad. It'll yeah. just murk them all. Um, and it's kind of the same thing. Have you ever noticed people that like going really heavy antibiotics? Uh, they're not the same. Like initially afterwards, you have to eat a lot of yogurt and probiotics where like it just wiped out your gut microbiome. 70% of your immune system is in your gut microbiome. And like it's ex- 
extremely uh, necessary for your your health and everything. There's a direct connection. Uh, just to analogize people to plants, um, our our intestines are like our root system, um, where they are inhabited by our microbiome that lives in there. They help break stuff down and deliver the nutrition to us. Your gut is connected directly to your vagus nerve. Uh, all the way straight to your brain. Um, and they're starting to find more and more that the consortia or the proportions of different microbes that are in your gut can have a huge turn on effect for more than just like your gut health. Like uh, there are certain ones that uh, like they're starting to find like might have more to do with like anxiety and depression or different mental disorders are really just uh, an imbalance in your gut microbiome. Wow, that's really interesting. And then kind of sticking to the topic of the amount of microbes, let's talk about CFU, uh, colony forming units. So I've got some recharge right here. I've got a microbial inoculant recharge. Uh, it says what the microbe is, and then next to it, it says, uh, for example, 6.4 CFU slash G. So what is what does that mean? What is a colony? What is CFU colony forming unit? Why should growers care about it when they're shopping for microbial inoculants? So colony, colony, colony forming units or CFUs, uh, that's in a per gram ratio. Um, so that's how many different, uh, like actual spores of that. And generally it's just used for the mycorrhizae that's in there, but how many, uh, active growing spores are in each gram and are able to, uh, start to inoculate and, uh, grow along the root. So the, the more, the higher, the number of CFUs you have, uh, the more of the actual spores that are in there. Um, and it's not usually a like necessary thing to be on there. So like when you look at soils or like ProMix HP, the ProMix high porosity with mycorrhizae, uh, it has almost no mycorrhizae in it because they put it in at like a per yard rate and it's really small to begin with, but they have mycorrhizae on the label where it's something else like recharge. Uh, we have a ton of mycorrhizae in there and not just, uh, it, it is a blend of endo and ecto. Um, for short day flowering plants, uh, we do run into ecto is really meant for trees. Like Christmas trees is a really good example um, where it branches out away from the plant. Um, ecto, meaning it's it's outside of. Uh, they've had different studies and stuff where they had like a whole commercial Christmas tree farm and they decided to put a fence around it. Uh, that fence, when they did it, they like cut through the ground. Um it was surrounded by a forest. They cut off that Christmas tree farm from its mycorrhizal network to the forest that's around it. And when it did that, it, uh, it put the whole Christmas tree into de- or Christmas tree farm into decline um, because that mycorrhizal network was using the forest around it to support those trees growing there. Not necessarily that they had all the nutrients that they needed right where they were, but the forest was able to support that. And when they put that fence in, it cut it off from everything, and they uh, like drastically noticed that their forest was going or that their Christmas tree farm was going into decline. That's insane. That's so crazy. Uh, I want to bring it back to what you said, which you had mentioned that there was a product that has mycorrhizal on it, but it's like barely anything, right? So I've actually interviewed somebody on this podcast before, and and this person had said that some products on the market today don't have enough CFUs to actually be effective. So I want to kind of highlight that point that there could be some products out there where they're on the label, but there's really not enough amount to be effective. Now, when we go through these individual microbes here, I don't know, I'm kind of kind of putting you under the gun here. If you have <laughs> any information on what CFU should be for each of these microbes as we go through of it, please, you know, let us know so we're not getting ripped off here. <laughs> oh, for sure. But, Generally, um, it's look for the highest numbers you can find. Um, just uh, it, in my opinion, having more good microbes in there, like those... Uh, those populations will figure themselves out once they're in the soil um, and into that environment where they actually start to uh, get selected for the environment that they're in. Um, but yeah, generally just a, a bigger number is better in this case. And so we don't really need to worry about like a balance. We don't have to like look at the back of the label and say, well, well this only has this CFUs, but this has a lot higher and it might throw off the diversity. Do we have to worry and about that? Or? So that's, so like labeling with things uh, is a big game that you have to play uh the back of labels it's almost always even your your fertilizers that you buy where it'll have like 20 20 20 on the side of it um that's a guaranteed minimum um that's not necessarily saying like the exact proportion of everything that's in there um so it's 
It's so hard. And like soil, they don't have to list the ingredients in order of what's in there the most. So they put mycorrhizae first and then list everything else because they think people will just think it's the same rules for food where like the thing that's in there and the highest amount is in there. So, I mean, it's kind of hard without actually trying stuff um, or getting it tested is even better to see uh, like what it actually tests out at. Wow. I didn't know that about. Yeah, I thought the order it was in just like food. I thought the order it was in was the most amount. Yeah, and no, it, it's it's all a game of guaranteed minimums on those things. So that makes it like as the end consumer, like I deal with it all the time with regulatory bodies and stuff. But the end consumer, it's really hard to look at something and just like uh, by the back of it, be able to know if like one, if that is completely truthful um, or yeah, it's it just makes it really difficult. I can't say with recharge, uh, everything is in there uh, far exceeds what we have on the label. That was like. We, we just put a lower number on there to be safe with everything. There's a lot more of uh, those microbes in there uh, when you actually get it tested. Gotcha. And just to touch on recharge real quick. So that's a microbial inoculant. It's got a whole bunch of different things in there, um, a long, bunch of beneficial microbes along with like kelp, molasses, humic acids, fulvic acids, amino acids. We, we really like to think about that more. Uh, there's a lot of microbial inoculants out there. This one comes together uh, like a really good instant compost tea, where not only does it have the uh, wide range of bacillus in there that are targeted at horticulture and agricultural systems. It's got the trichoderma fungi. Uh, molasses is a food stock for everything. They're built on kelp as a carrier. It's got the L-amino acids. And uh, a lot of people don't realize with amino acids, if they're not in their L form, they are not plant available at all. Um, so like it has to be L amino acids or your plant's not going to be able to utilize them at all. Um, and then humic and fulvic acids, which just act as like chelators. Um, so they help, uh, the micros be able to do their job a little bit more effectively. So, uh, not only are the chelators, they act as kind of catalysts for biological reactions too, uh, where they lower the energy of activation needed to start a reaction so that it's just a more efficient, uh, metabolism going on in there. Gotcha. And just for trans transparency purposes, what's your affiliation with Recharge? Uh, I am uh, an operations manager over at Recharge, so yeah, I do have gotcha. on the <laughs> <laughs> represent. Just being just being transparent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, do work for them. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, it makes sense. But it is a great product. Something I use in my garden off and on. Like I mentioned in Scotty's episode, is like. I try to switch things up for my viewers, you know, and if you do the same thing over and over again, the viewers get bored. So every once in a while, I'll, I'll kick in some recharge, um, but I love it. So it's good stuff. Very nice. Now let's get into some of the individual microbes. You have knowledge on quite a bit of them. Let's start <laughs> with uh, trichoderma. Want to talk to us about that? Okay. Trichoderma is one of my favorite ones. Um, it is a voracious decomposer. Um, it's probably the class I would put it in. Uh, like it, it's origin story of where trichoderma actually started it comes from a single point of contact in the South Pacific during World War II. Um, they had set up camp somewhere like in the, the monsoon season uh, in the South Pacific, believe in the Philippines. They had wax canvas tents everywhere. Like at that time, that's what everyone was using. They had set up camp within three days. Their wax canvas tents, which are extremely waterproof and just resistant to anything going on environmentally, uh, started literally melting away. Um, and it's because they had come into contact with some trichoderma fungi. Um, that was collected as a sample, brought back to labs, and then a lot of work has been done with it since then. Um, it's used in a lot of industrial processes that like never really get mentioned. It's used in stonewashing jeans. Um, I'm trying to think of something else it's used in. But in gardening... They found out that uh, it is able to really, really, really uh, quickly break down those organic nutrients that you'd be putting into your soil um, so that they are able to get to a plant available form much faster. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it also is very competitive um, with other fungi that are around um, and is able to outcompete uh, most of the pathogenic ones um, that it's going to come into contact with. And so there are different strains of it. Um, just kind of looking at recharge. It's uh, let's see what you got. You got trichoderma reese. I'm, I'm going to butcher these names, by the way. So <laughs> yeah. fair warning: these names are easily uh, be able to be butchered. Trichoderma harazinum. Harazinum. Uh, har <laughs> harazinium. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry, I struggle yeah. with that one too. <laughs> Do you have anything to add, like on those specific types of strains? Or? Uh, 
it's not it's not super necessary to go into like uh the specific strains of those just that trichoderma is like a class uh it is very quick at breaking stuff down especially organic nutrients um it it's uh like a single celled fungi so it's not uh where it's going to have like mushrooms growing off of the top of it or anything like that but it really uh is able to get in there and it's uh, good for bioprotection um and preventing any of those root pathogens from popping up okay gotcha another one that uh bacillus you know let's move on to that i see bacillus in almost every single one of the micro products that i that i have and um looks like you guys got three different strains of it I, is that right strains different strains of them oh uh, yeah okay. yeah strains of them um okay. talk to us about bacillus so bacillus is really cool it is one of the like real turn on effects uh in microbial inoculants um most people give the credit to mycorrhizae and that's been like a buzzword for years in gardening uh most people don't realize that ecto mycorrhizae can't even infect short day flowering plants um or the medicinal plants people like to grow uh it just doesn't have enough time to get in there and start to build up that network uh, where the endomycorrhizae is actually the one that uh, is able to do stuff in there. Um, but those have been buzzwords and don't really do that much, in my opinion. Bacillus are really the like main turn-on effect for root growth promotion in the soil, um, where they're able to make, uh, like endogenously inside of themselves, IBA to help uh, plants root out and get more root shoots uh, and secondary and tertiary, tertiary rooting. So it has... Uh, like exponentially more root tips to be able to absorb nutrition from. Um, bacillus are really cool. Uh, they're also really easy to start selecting for different environments that you want them to be able to persist better in. Um, and then what my favorite fact about them, um, it's all called a consortia. Uh, when you have uh, like a population of different microorganisms um, and when you have the right proportions of the right ones, uh, you get uh, an effect that's like much more than the sum of their parts where it's not just like an additive effect where they're going together. It's uh, like uh, exponentially making it better um, and able to have a more uh, turn-on effect for the plant. What about geobacillus? So that's one I'm not super familiar with. Uh, I know that uh, it was discovered inside of like geysers um, or hot water vents like at the bottom of the seabed uh, where these uh, bacillus, I don't think they have too much uh use in plants um just where their like preferred environment is over like 95 celsius uh so like right near the the boiling point of water um but really cool microbes uh i know in industry they're going to start to use those a lot more just be in the the type of applications that they're in like higher heat environments and stuff um and th i think they also live in like your hot water heater they'll find them in a hot water heater sometimes just because it's a place where it's like right around 100 degrees Celsius all the time, and they are basically the only thing that lives in that type of environment and can uh, can thrive there. What about Glomus? I see that so, on a lot of products. So Glomus, Glomus uh, is mycorrhizae. Um, so there's an endo and an ecto form of it. Ecto is on the outside of the root uh, and grows like out into the soil. And in an effect, it does exponentially increase the surface area of the soil. It helps the plant uh, deal with environmental stresses better. Um, just in endogenously, it is able to uh, kind of handle those stresses better. Uh, the the microbes can help elicit a uh, like acquired resistance response from the plant, where it knows like, hey, I need to close up my uh, my pores um, because I need to uh, conserve water in like a time of drought. Um, they're pretty cool. And again, so like CFUs, just kind of going back to that when somebody's. You know, this right here has, you know, 6.4 CFUs per gram. You just, just the more the better, huh? Like, can you the overdo more, mycorrhizae? The more the better, all? generally. Uh, no, you're not going to be able to overdo it. Uh, I mean, I guess you could in a, like, financial sense. Yeah, you know? okay. And where, yeah. where you're just throwing money away at some point. Um, I generally don't think of the mycorrhizae uh, that's in most mi microbial products as being something that's really doing all that much. Just because you have to get it on super early um in the the growth of the plant when there's not that many roots so that it is able to grow alongside the root as it grows uh in microbial inoculants and in microbiology and soils the the bacillus and the different types of trichoderma fungi that can be in there are going to be the ones that are doing the, the majority of the work for everything while mycorrhizae gets all the fame 
Now, mycorrhizae, I heard that it's a lot, like significantly less effective watering in mycorrhizae versus sprinkling onto the roots. Oh, uh, most, oh, most definitely. Uh, that's one of the things a lot of people don't realize with it is that for that uh, colony forming unit to be able to actually infect a root, a root has to come in direct contact with it. Uh, it can't just pass by it or anything. It has to directly make contact with the root. Uh, that's why with, with recharge, water is always the carrier for it. Um, it gets it evenly and thoroughly through the soil. And if there's a root in there, some mycorrhizae is going to make contact with it. Um, with just a pure myco product or something like that, uh, powdering the roots is what you're going to want to do. Just because in that case, at least you know you're making contact uh, with the roots. Like we were talking about ProMix earlier, where they have the ProMix with mycorrhizae in there. Uh, there's not that much mycorrhizae in there to begin with. And just the, the odds are not stacked in your favor that a root is actually going to make contact with like the one colony forming unit that's around in a pot once you've planted something in there um so yeah i mean making sure that it gets contact with a root is definitely going to help it be more effective um at uh infecting that root and being able to give you those beneficial effects of it now would you go so far as to say that you shouldn't water it in uh no i would i wouldn't okay. go that that far um i mean there's definitely times where like you're just not going to be able to uh, pull out a plant and powder the roots with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if if you have a high enough CFU, like what's in recharge, um, you definitely can water it in. Um, although we really just have the mycorrhizae in there to be able to say, like, yeah, it, it's in there, too. We have that. But we're really proud of the consortia of the different bacillus and trichoderma that are in recharge. Yeah, I'm really, really curious to know, like, for example, Great White is one of those products that uh, is known for, for mycorrhiza. I'm really curious to know, like, of that scoop of Great White you're mixing into water and putting in there, what percentage is actually going to be hitting the roots? You know what I mean? I think that's probably an answer you don't have. but Yeah, yeah. Not, not one I have off the top of my head. And just want to admit, like, I uh, greatly respect Great White and what they did. Uh, started to bring, like, a premium microbe uh consortia out to the public and getting it out there um but a lot of innovation has gone on uh recently in uh microbiology it's the biggest expanding field in uh agriculture and horticulture um it's it's just gonna it's like the big next thing in agriculture where people are starting to realize that like just dumping fertilizer especially in uh commercial agriculture out in fields and everything that just dumping fertilizer on your land was killing off all the endogenous microorganisms that you had and making it really really hard to garden there uh where you it, it's more treating it like uh hydroponics at that point the soil is just your media it's completely dead and inert um but yeah getting back to bringing the life into your soil um is I mean, it, it helps everybody uh, and just getting being uh, more efficient at the fertilizer that you do use. Um, it's it's pretty cool. I'm I'm excited to be in this field. Kind of piggybacking off of what you just said, synthetic fertilizers, do they really kill off microbes or do the microbes feed off of some of them? Or, or what's your take on that? It, uh, like we were talking about earlier, it depends on what microbes you're using. If you're uh, brewing up a compost tea with some like soil from the force that you've gone and collected, uh, yeah, the, the, the different chemical fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers are going to kill some of your microbes. But if you're using uh, ones that have been selected and bred uh, for their virulency and they're able to, their ability to persist in those horticulture and agricultural systems like we as uh, medicinal gardeners use, um, they, are, they thrive in that situation um, where they are able to adsorb and hold on to nutrition, act as a bioprotectant. They don't really care that the salts are around them. Uh, if they've been selected to live in that environment and, and be able to uh, thrive there. Uh, so no, um, if you're using the right microbes, then no, there's no issue with using, uh, being in like a higher salinity environment, using synthetics or anything like that. Now, how about pH up and pH down? I know there's a lot of people, they'll get their water. They'll need to pH adjust their water. Maybe the, the original water that they have is coming in too high. For example, is sodium bicarbonate at high pH. So they need to add in a couple drops of pH down, which normal pH down, I believe most of them are phosphoric acid. Right? And so they think that those couple drops, all it really takes is a couple drops, two, three drops, maybe a milliliter to bring that down to the acceptable range. Now, there are people out there that 
to use that phosphoric acid, mix in, get their water adjusted. But then when they water their plants, like you're killing off microbes. What's your take no. on that? Uh, so once you actually dilute the pH up and pH down, it's not going to have any effect on the microbes. Like I was saying earlier, they're able to operate at a real wide range of pHs. Um, and just a, a, a pretty good point to make, the water when you're doing that is not their native environment. We want to get them out of the water and into the soil as soon as we possibly can uh, to prevent selecting for a waterborne environment. These are root growth or uh, root born microorganisms. Uh, they are meant to be in the root zone. We don't want to keep them in the water too long. It's just meant to be a really good, even thorough carrier to get them all the way through the soil instead of just having like pockets of it here and there. Now, what about adding pH up and pH down directly? I know we're kind of getting off topic here. We're talking about microbes, but this kind of follows up here. So when you're adding pH up and pH down directly to a nutrient mix, I've heard that that's going to bind with some of those nutrients and potentially make them an unusable form. So it was recommended that you should be diluting down, right? Mixing your pH up and down in water first. So it bonds to that and then putting it into your nutrient solution. Is that a true Just story a, or is that uh, not? True, true, true story. In general okay. chemistry, um, that's going to be the way that you would want to do that. Just to where you're not adding concentrated acid or concentrated base uh, to your solution that already has nutrients in it. Just because it is fairly easy for uh, some chemical reactions to happen there. And you have some like fallout um, or precipitate is what it's called in chemistry. Where uh, I don't know if you've ever mixed up the main one people see is silica where they'll mix up their nutrients first and then put silica in and you just see it get all cloudy. And then there's like silicate at the bottom of your, uh, your reservoir. And that's just where that silica can't go in a concentrated form. Can't go in with anything else. It needs to get diluted first so that when you mix the other stuff in, it's not in that high concentration. That's going to cause a precipitate or anything like that. Um, Most of the time with microbes, uh, when you're watering them in, You want to mix your nutrients how you normally do. So if you're mixing silica, mix that first. Go ahead and mix up your A or your B. Um, pH how you normally do. And then go ahead and add the microbes in as like the last thing. So that they're not experiencing a huge pH change or anything. When they get into the water, um, they do raise the pH uh, just as a function of their biology. Water is not their native environment like we were talking about. We want to get them in the soil. As soon as they get in the soil, which is their native environment, they start to uh, make carbonic acid and carboxylic carboxylic acid. Uh, like there's a whole group of acids that they're able to make. And that's how they buffer and regulate the pH around uh, themselves and where they inhabit the root zone. So it kind of makes it to where pH doesn't matter as much anymore because a, a much more natural system is taking care of that for you. Gotcha. I'm glad you confirmed that and dilute the pH up and pH down. Cause I actually made a video on that and it has over a hundred thousand views. And, um, you know, that's what I learned and I wanted to See, confirm it with people and you kind of confirmed that one. So there was people and, in the comments section, like, no way, this is bullshit, useless, blah, 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 blah. So, <laughs> it's, um, it's, and just want to clarify too, that, uh, you can still put, pH up or pH down directly into your nutrient solution, especially if it's being stirred the whole time, because it's only going to be super concentrated as like the couple of seconds that that drop hits the water and then it gets diluted right away. And there's not really that much opportunity for like a precipitate to form um, or you just start to change what's going on in that nutrient solution. So it's not detrimental. No, not not super detrimental. The main one is silica. Mix your silica up with plain water first. Uh, and then start mixing in your nutrients and everything. Gotcha. Okay. Let me get, let's get back on the individual microbes kind of off course a little bit, but I think it's, it all relates and it's really good information. So, yeah, uh, this next one, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing pan bacillus, pan bacillus. Pan bacillus is just another one of, uh, like classification of different bacillus that are out there. Um, and it acts like a root growth promoting rhizobacteria. Um, they're in there. They make IAA, uh, indoleacetic acid, um, some other root growth promotion uh, enzymes and stuff. Um, and uh, I think that they're able to elicit somewhat of a SARS response from the plant too, um, where it kind of just gets it ready for if there was going to be some type of pathogen or bug coming around, it's just going to be better able to deal with those stresses and better able to uh, trigger its immune response coming from them. Okay. How about Pseudomonas? I pronounced that one right? Pseudomonas? Pseudomonas. There we go. Um, 
that's going to be one that lives much more like on plant surfaces. I'm pretty sure. Um, so that'll be the one you'll see in like uh, foliar microbial products a lot. Um, not one that I'm super familiar with. That's something I need to do a little bit more research on myself. Okay. The last one I have on the list here is Streptomyces. I get that one right? No, Stre- Streptomyces. Uh, Myces, okay. <laughs> I told you I was going to be butchering names. <laughs> <laughs> the Pseudomonas Streptomyces, like all are pretty much just like plant growth promoters, uh, make some substances that kind of uh, outcompete uh, pathogens that could be coming around and then can kind of help make the trigger the plant to start making its own uh, like root growth promotion um, substances that it makes in there, IAA, IBA, other stuff like that. Okay. Is there any other microbes you, that I didn't list off that you think we should cover or is that pretty much the, the most of it? Uh, I think we pretty much got most of it. Okay, cool. Now, how about, I got a couple other things for you. Amino acids, you touched on them a little bit earlier. You mentioned that they have to be in the L form. Is there anything else you could talk to us about amino acids? Oh, definitely. So L amino acids, um, are necessary for all life, not just plants. Like we need amino acids. Our body makes amino acids. Um, they're like the building blocks for enzymes. Um, enzymes. Uh, act as catalysts for chemical reactions uh, where they make them uh, like the soil has to exert less energy to get a chemical reaction to happen. So it's just kind of overall optimizing the entire system. Um, It helps plants translocate nutrients better Um, there. I mean, they're huge, especially in uh, when people in synthetics are trying to grow high bricks plants. Um, one of their like limiting factors in being able to get to like a higher bricks level, which corresponds with a higher, uh, plant health and resistant to pathogens and bugs and everything. Um, uh, like the, the main thing that they're missing when they're trying to do that is having those amino acids. Um, and amino acids aren't just like uh, just singular things too. They can be complexed with other things, uh, where it can help nitrogen get into the plant better it can help uh just about anything get into the plant better um it's it's just one of the big things in like the newer uh I'm trying to think bio fertilizers that are coming out um that the use of those amino acids and using them uh for their intended purpose to help nutrients get into the plant and help the plant just overall optimize its metabolism better uh has helped a lot of people get to like another yield threshold in their garden um, or get over a certain yield limiting factor. Sometimes those L amino acids are going to be the limiting factor there. So like you mentioned, amino acids has multiple uses. One thing I learned actually from Harley Smith, shout out to him. I took his master growers course last year oh, is, awesome. uh, specifically for hydroponic growers. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, right? So hydroponic growers, some of the calcium you'll get like like the ring around the calcium deposits, basically it, it's basically calcium carbonate is what it turns into. If using hard water, for example, right. Um, or, yeah. That, that calcium is bonding to uh, like dissolve carbon dioxide in the water um, and making that calcium carbonate. And a little trick to avoid that is what he had mentioned is sprinkle a little bit of amino acids in that water and it'll actually bind to the amino acid. and It'll prevent that ring, yep. those rings and, from occurring, which I thought was super interesting. That's what I was talking about with like amino complex nutrients, uh, where, yeah, it, it, uh, makes it 100% just more bioavailable to the plant and prevents any type of lockout going on there just because it, uh, will have a much higher affinity to that calcium than the carbonate that's, uh, in, that's dissolved or the, the CO2 that's dissolved into the water. Okay. Gotcha. Another thing that uh, I wanted to bring up is dextrose. So we kind of briefly talked about this before we started recording. Um, dextrose is something that, I, I mean, I got a, another micro product here is Blue Planet Nutrients Root Magic Rhizomix. And it says 20% dextrose. Can you explain to us what it is? So and dextrose is just a, a type of uh, sugar that's made by plants. Um, I mean, that's what plants do uh they photosynthesize sunlight co2 and water and turn that into carbohydrates and sugars for themselves um to be able to use for energy to uh make the medicinal flowers that we like De- so dextrose is one of those like sucrose fruc- fructose glucose 
Um, I mean, there's a whole range of sugars. I'm never going to be one to say more diversity in something is a bad thing. So, like, if you're trying to do the best you possibly can, using a variety of sugar sources um, is not the worst idea in the world. But molasses, um, it generally acts as, like, the one of the better um, food sources for microorganisms. Um, just where it is, it's a complete sugar. Um, it has everything they need. And yeah, I mean, uh, you can use like some people use honey. Some people use, uh, like high fructose corn syrup if they're crazy. Um, like there's lots of different options. Brown sugar, brown sugar out there. And the different types of sugars, uh, can actually bloom out, uh, different types of microbes will prefer different types of, uh, sugar sources. Um, so, yeah, you, using a wide variety of them, if you're trying to have the most diversity you possibly can, um, or with something like Recharge, using the molasses that's in there is meant uh, for the, the, the microbes that are in there as their food source. Molasses. A little, I want to get a little bit deeper into that. I've been told that it shouldn't be used as a soil drench. At least there's some people out there that say there's research that backs that it shouldn't be used as a soil drench because it, uh, and I'm speaking above my head a little bit here, it binds with something it clogs up the roots prevents nutrient uptake something along those lines are you familiar with that at all or it can if you use it in really really high concentrations um it can start to clog root pores um okay. and and clog up root tips so that it's not able to absorb as much nutrition uh, you kind of run into the same thing with uh humic acids too you have to use a ton of them uh like a ton a ton of them but it, it can start to uh clog root pores and stuff like that Generally not a problem with people's gardens at all, unless they're like, I dump the whole bottle of molasses into my watering can and like try and go water that in. Like then you might have an issue if you're using it at like a teaspoon per gallon or something like that. There shouldn't be an issue at all. I usually use a tablespoon per gallon. Tablespoon per gallon shouldn't be an issue at all either. All right, Guru, we have covered a lot. I have learned so much. I'm definitely gonna be watching this over and over again. Uh, Tell us, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, you can check me out on the Dude Grow Show uh, every Monday through Friday on YouTube or any of the podcast apps that you have. Uh, my own Instagram is uh, Sean dot Crayer S C A N dot K R A Y E R. If you guys want to check me out there, uh, I do. I'm a pretty interesting person. I like to think I uh, <laughs> I'm pretty big into photography and fly fishing. I've got a couple dogs and stuff, um, and just. Recently, I've had a little hiatus from actually growing myself, um, but getting back into that too. So I'll start I'll be starting a YouTube channel soon, um, and going to be posting content on there pretty regularly too. Let me know when you, you launch that YouTube channel. I'll link it down in the description section below. In the meantime, I'll link the Dude Grow Show down in the description section below and his Instagram. Uh, but let me know once you launch that channel because I'll add that in as well. Um, so 100%. Folks can, Thank you. Yeah, so folks can subscribe to you and. I'm definitely looking forward to your videos there. You have extensive knowledge in microbes and other areas, chemistry, clearly. Um, so I'm looking forward to subbing up to you there and seeing what you put out for content. It'll be cool. Yeah, I always have fun watching your content, too. You get some really good guests on there all the time. All right, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please click that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. I'm trying to get past 100. I think we're there, almost there. But uh, thank you to everyone who takes the time to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Share it. Share this video if you found value in it. If you know somebody who would benefit from this information, please share it. I know there have been tons of people sharing it on Facebook groups, Reddit pages, individually. So any way you can share it, it's greatly appreciated. It's going to help. Uh, get more viewers here. It's going to help uh, subscribers, help with ranking, uh, be shown people's recommended, so on and so forth. So, again, thank you to everyone who decides to share this podcast. Well, Guru, this has been awesome. I am so thankful that you decided to come on here. And, uh, yeah, I will leave it at that. I'm super happy to be here, man. It's been a great time. All right, man. Have a great day. You too.